Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, Rich. How you doing? Hey, guy. Doing great, man. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your uh, busy weeks. I think everything's getting a little hectic these days, isn't it, guy, with Christmas just around the corner? We were just talking yeah. about that. Yeah, it uh, just seems like it sneaks up on us every year. So, uh, but we'll uh, going to go ahead and get started and uh, talk, talk today about uh, working with medical referrals. I know Rich and I have been doing this a long time. We both, uh, I think, built our practices primarily on this concept. I mean, there's ways of marketing now that you can get referrals uh, other ways. But uh, if you work hard and get the medical referrals and put the time in, uh, it can be a long-term uh, uh uh, recurring patients coming into your office and uh, and they're good patients too. They're patients that maybe already know they have apnea. They're patients that um, uh, maybe already have sleep tests and a lot of the work's that done uh, as opposed to some external advertising. So, For sure. Rich, we've been doing this a while. Uh, I, don't, I think we can, a lot of people listen to our webinars regularly. We've done thousands of devices and been doing this for pushing 20 years each, I think now. Yeah, you think, you know, and people talk about, you know, how much we know it's it's because we made a lot of mistakes along the way. So we've tried a lot of things and we're just two guys out there. Uh, one of our passions is, is helping other dentists succeed at this. So um, I love your quote there. I don't know if you put that in there or Jason did, but, you know, I, th I think that's a lot of this is at the heart of uh, getting out there and talking to MDs. I really think, Guy, because I, I think most of us as dentists feel like, oh, they know more about it than I do, or I don't know that much. And I, I promise you, if you've just listened to the last 10 webinars that we've done, you know more about this than the majority of the physicians out there. So you, you got you to gotta overcome some of that for sure. Yeah, I think that we get in our own way on this. And I, I did put the slide in, and I think it is truly when we train people and they, they, they know more than most physicians they're going to go talk to, and they're still apprehensive. And You've got to remember that uh, the other Roosevelt, uh, Theodore, said, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. And I think, what are we afraid of? Are we afraid that they know more than us? Are, are we afraid, I hear that, well, the dental devices don't work as well? And, and uh, you know, I think it's a big stick myself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, dental devices, we'll talk a little bit today about how things have changed since Rich and I started doing this and that you know, dental devices were looked down on before. before and uh the evidence wasn't there that they work, and more and more evidence comes out that uh, it's even argued that, that the dental devices work better when we're looking at the mean disease alleviation calculation because because patients wear them. So don't don't feel you're going to these doctors with some you know if nothing else works here's my my service. The, the dental devices have a place and uh, it's growing and we have a great solution for many patients. So uh, I think Richard, the one that taught me that saying, get out of our own ways. Uh, we just can't be, be afraid, uh, and we have to be confident uh, in what we're doing. Yeah, I, I was the first time I seen that quote, Guy, when you put this thing together, you and Jason, and that, that uh, you know, he's kind of the father of, of sleep in a lot of ways and, the, you know, has authored, I don't know how many hundreds of uh, sleep research articles, and uh, that's pretty scary when you read something like that. Yeah, I mean, the man's been dedicating his life. I think if you Google uh, Dr. Demand, it'll come up the father of sleep, like you said, and here he's saying we've made uh, uh, not a great strides in, in primary care uh, for for uh, uh, sleep disorders, and uh, he's dedicated his whole life. So hopefully by you all taking this evening uh, and us taking our evening to get this together for you, uh, we can make a, a, a change in that. We can We can make an impact. And again, Dental sleep medicine works. Uh, I think that's one of the fears a lot of people have, and it, it does. And if you're new to this, stick with it. Uh, dental devices have a have a, a, a great uh, place in helping patients uh, with sleep disorder breathing. Can I tell you one quick story about that guy? Sure. I, I have an ENT that comes into my practice, and he sits down in the chair, and he says, "Hey, Rich." If this thing works for me, I'm gonna, I'm sure gonna send you a bunch of patients. And I think most dentists would go, well, well, yeah, I sure hope it works for you. And I, you know, I said, well, shame on you. He kind of stepped back and looked at me. He's like, what? You don't want my referrals? I said, of course I want your referrals. You know, I, I like to treat patients. That's why I get up and go to work for every day. But 
if this doesn't work on you, that just tells me it's going to work on the next three or four people that walk through the door. That this isn't just about you. And he goes, you know what? You're right. I, I take that back. You know, right. it was it was just kind of but it was kind of like his whole point was, wow, does this really work? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it does. It's that reality check. This does work. And I think uh, we're spending a lot of time talking about the actual interaction and the fears dentists have, but I honestly believe this is more important than when we tell you what to bring or what to say. Uh, I think just having the confidence. And I think when it comes to the physicians and they start questioning this or that, uh, if we're just honestly there to say, I want to help our patients, and sometimes CPAP's the best choice. Sometimes dental devices are the best choice. Sometimes combination therapy. And any objection or questions that the physicians have, any concerns you have, if we go at, at this, well, look, I don't know everything. I know a lot. I'm always learning. I'm here to help my patients. And right. together with you, doctor, and, 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 and me as a, a dentist that provides one aspect of this, we're going to help our patients, whatever that is. And sometimes it's CPAP, sometimes it's dental devices, and sometimes it's other treatments. But uh, together we're going to do this. And if you just keep that attitude, I really think it helps. Uh, and, and underneath all this, I think you're getting the message. You've got to believe uh, in what you do. You have to have the belief that, that we're doing this for the right reasons and that we're going to help our patients. And if you have that, you know what? Uh, I'll probably misspeak a half dozen times or more tonight. I, I don't have the greatest grasp of the English language at times. And uh, But when I go meet with a physician, we get along okay. And they realize I believe in what I'm doing. I care about the patients. And you don't have to be the most articulate uh, uh dynamic person in the world if you if you if you believe in what you're doing and are prepared which we're going to make you prepared in a few minutes you're going to do just just fine when you go meet with these uh these doctors i think if that's all you get out of this tonight guy you've taken something away i mean you hit the nail on the head there you know you 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 can't fake sincerity you know you just can't and and that's one thing that you have going for you you believe in what you're doing and you're sincere about wanting to help people. And if, if you feel that way as well, that should really help you get over some of the fears of this and doing this. But when we, you know, when we look at the, the, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and, and they came out in 2006 with the practice parameters and then they updated them again in 2015. And, you know, you, you have to remember that when we treat sleep apnea, we're treating multiple things. Uh, and a lot of what the physicians want to look at is simply the AHI or how low the oxygen goes. They don't always want to look at subjectively how they feel and all this other stuff. So we have to remember that, take a step back and look at a lot of that. But remember, when we, we, we look at this thing, you know, for the most part, CPAP works a little bit better uh, at, at the AHI and the, the oxygen desaturation index. But we've got to remember that patients don't always wear their CPAP and, and the compliance is much better for the dental devices. Yeah, and understand that these parameters were put together by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, so the physicians in conjunctions with the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. So this isn't, you know, Guy and Rich's opinion here, nor is it just the Dental Society's opinion. It's a joint effort to try to help the patients. And by the way, I don't see any questions up here right now, but if you have questions, uh, type them in. Uh, we've got a big group over several hundred people uh, registered tonight. So uh, if you have questions, type them in. We'll get them. Uh, to everyone, uh, get to them all before the, the, the night's over. Um, when it comes to, to why dental devices work, I think we've uh, kind of honed in on this already, but effectiveness of the treatment equals the efficacy of the treatment times the compliance. And I think for many years, I, I would honestly say, Rich, when we first started doing this, this efficacy is all they looked at. We crank up the CPAP and the dental devices uh, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, no, don't work as well when we measure them side by side in a lab. And until they started looking at compliance, uh, there was a strong argument against dental devices. But uh, in the real world, there's a huge uh, difference when you start putting the compliance in. And if you think of CPAP being 100% effective, although it's, it's really not in some cases, but even if we gave them that and we had uh, the patient only wearing it half the time, we got an overall 50% overall treatment effectiveness. And on the inverse of that, if a dental device was – maybe 70 percent is effective so the efficacy rather so like if we I mean reduce the AHI you know 70 percent as much but they wore it every night the overall health benefit or treatment effectiveness will be 70 percent and so you have to see how those two things combine to uh, give us uh, good options for dental uh, for apnea and dental sleep medicines one of them and um, 
I, I, I think a lot of doctors don't know this right here, this slide, Rich. If you went to them and said, okay, have apnea, what are your treatment choices? What are the first line of therapy treatment choices according to the ASM? I, I think that a lot of things would, they'd all put CPAP, but do you think dental device would, would be on most of the primary cares in the world, uh, in our country anyway? Well, you got to remember, I do 10 to 15 lunch and learns every single week. I mean, a month. I'm sorry. Every single month. Oh, on, you are busy. <laughs> every single month. Sorry. And, uh, you know, I had two today. We, we did a group of 10 physicians. Only two of the physicians came in at lunchtime. All 30 staff came, but only two of the physicians. And both of the young female physicians said, man, I'm so glad you came. I didn't even know you existed. I uh -huh. didn't even know this was an option. Both of them said that to me today. So just today, yeah, guy, I have, you know, for the for the average physician, it's like, well, let's change mass. Well, what kind of mass did you have? You know, let's do this, let's do that. It's just a different iteration of CPAP. So yeah, we 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 need to take it on ourselves to go out there and educate these physicians about that. I don't know any other way to do it than to just get out there and do it. Yeah, keep in mind that these are the two first line of therapy treatments and. Uh, and it's okay that they don't know that. Uh, I expect them not to, and don't be, I don't defensive uh, when that happens. Just understand that your job is to help them understand the standard of care that maybe they're not up to speed on. So, all right. Well, uh, just a reminder: if you want CE for this, you'll get the CE uh, in your in, uh, inbox in the next 72 hours. If you don't see it there immediately, why don't you check your spam? That's probably where it is. Uh, other than that, you can let us know, but you should get an hour. Of CE if you stay on uh, through the whole thing. Uh, next month, Rich, we get to get the night off. Yeah, <laughs> all right. And you got two really good uh, speakers coming at you. You know, when you look at marketing, if you guys haven't uh, heard uh, Mark Fowler, he is a just wealth of information, and, and Jason, of course, knows everything about just about everything. So. Uh, the two of them together will uh, put on a fantastic thing and you really give you a bunch of different ideas about how to market. We're kind of focusing tonight more on just the MD aspect of that, but they'll give you a lot of other ideas. Yeah, and they've got a wealth of knowledge of marketing between them, so I uh, look forward to hearing that uh, myself. Um, for those of you who don't, uh, aren't familiar, the North American Dental Sleep Medicine Symposium is February 15th and 16th. Uh, it's going to be a full house. Uh, it's our third year doing it. We have some of the country's leading experts giving one hour real practical uh, courses on dental sleep. I can honestly say uh, this is bias coming from us, but but I, I hear it from almost everyone who attends how great a meeting it is. And if you want some real practical, uh, fast-paced education on dental sleep in a wonderful setting at the Hyatt in Clearwater, Florida, I don't know where you live, but Chances are the weather might be better uh, down here in Florida <laughs> that that time of year. Pretty good, so, chance, <laughs> pretty good, pretty good shot, uh, and it's very reasonable. Five ninety-five for the dentist and uh, four ninety-five for the team members for a day and a half. Uh, come join us, uh, Rich, and I'll be there uh, uh, talking as amongst uh, another dozen or so uh, countries experts. Uh, last bit of uh, information here too: we just got our. Uh, course schedule for 2019. We will be adding to this, but this is uh, uh, the, the majority of it here, so you can see the dates. And uh, if you type in course uh, tonight, uh, you will receive $200 off the, the fee. It's uh, The normal fee is $9.95, so it's, uh, was that, $7.95. Uh, you get a sleep test for the doctor. You get to bring a team member. It's a two-day course, hands-on. You get a dental device made that you can wear yourself or you can use as a, as a study model afterwards. And uh, myself are teaching these. Uh, Dr. Uh, Stacy Layman's teaching some of them. Uh, we're 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 going to um, teach you how to do this in your offices if you uh, really want to know a step by step process to do it. That's what our our courses are are all about. So hope uh, to see. You. And if you're not sure which one you want to go, just type in course and Jody or Brandy will get back with you to uh, at least find out which one you want to go to and secure that two hundred dollars off. So, okay, Guy, I got it. I got to add in there. It's the cheapest way I know to get sleep tested and treated you know on yeah, top the, of that. plus you get two days of education yeah i mean so the price of admissions worth sleep sleep test. Test. yeah exactly <laughs> cheaper than going to your primary care and, get, and getting treated certainly uh mm -hmm. and, and you know it's 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 a really good weekend uh, i think uh you'll you'll absolutely get a ton out of it we have rave reviews for it so 
if you want to know, you know, cookbook, how you do this in your practice, come see us at one of those courses next year. Uh, finding referral sources, Rich. I mean, I, I, I'm interested to see how do you how do you find? I mean, we're going to talk about what you do when you go to the referral sources in a little bit. But how do you locate the ones that the uh, the people like you went to today? Yeah, I I think you know I'm gonna steal a little bit of your thunder here, guy, because you got some of these slides are later. But you just have to be persistent at this. You know, you got to look under every rock and behind every tree and. You know, I mean, you can find them in a restaurant, you know, that um, you can, uh, I saw some, talk to somebody in line at a, um, standing in line to get on a Southwest flight the other day. The guy was a physician. He heard me talking about uh, snoring or something to this patient. He goes, oh, what do you know about that? And the next thing you know, I'm talking about it. And I'm, I, I think I found some patients for the dentist in that town, you know, from that guy. So he, here's a, a short list, but, you know, again, uh, your staff, you know, we have, people we have groups we go to church we go to meetings we do all of these kinds of things and we just we just have to you know come out of our shell a little bit i think so many of we dentists are a little bit introverted you know it kind of we attract a little bit of that type of of uh, person into the profession itself but you got to come out of that a little bit and just look everywhere yeah look everywhere uh, and talk to everybody, and, and these people come out of the woodwork. Uh, I went to um, Kentucky to teach a course last weekend and ended up uh, getting, and this is uh, just how much people want to talk about, the Uber driver is going to come see me uh, as a patient, you know. So if you, all you have to do is mention what you do, and people will talk to you. Uh, one of the things that I did in my practice, though, to tr actually find referral sources is I hired someone who was outgoing, and uh, they didn't mind going knocking on doors and, you know, the, we we found people we thought might be interested, and and I sent them on. If you see here, these scouting missions. Uh, you know, we're busy, and I don't know it's the best utilization of a dentist's time to spend two days knocking on, co calling on door on uh, on offices they don't know. But uh, this lady I hired, she was more than happy to do it, and then she would vet the offices and find the people that were interested, and then set up further meetings for myself or and or the rest of the team to meet him. So that worked out really well. Once. Uh, once you got your foot through the door, we'll talk about starting with your own patients in a little while too. That's a great way to get your foot through the door too. Lunch and learns, uh, meetings, uh, awake is something I think I'll mention. In a lot of the areas, uh, they have awake groups, and awake's a support group for people who who are having trouble with CPAP, and it's a national organization, and they put on meetings every few months, and they're usually looking for speakers. So if yeah. you have a, a an awake group in your area, you contact and say, "Hey, I'd like to come and talk sometime." And you could come and talk to there's at least the ones I've been to. There's been a few dozen patients there, and some doctors and DME companies, and you get to come in and give a little presentation about where dental devices fit in, and always walk away from that with a few patients, and then also solidify some um, of the the physicians uh, uh, who are there to, to to work with them in the future. I love that guy. I mean, I I have a full time marketing person. That's all she does is go out there and get me, you know. So when we set one up, we did one today. It was in a in a in a big medical building, and she shows up early. She gets the food set up, and then she walks around the the build. You can't do this everywhere, but she walked around. She visited six other doctors' offices before I got there to do the lunch and learn, and she set up two more lunch and learns. Well. So that that's convenient because they're all in the same building, but you can also look at that. So it, it it's a numbers game. You got to keep at it. You know, you like you said here, guy. You know, you treat your own patients in your own office, and they tell people. And this thing just really has a very much a ripple effect on how it starts to build momentum. Yeah, and I think if we're going to treat patients in our own office, uh, we have other webinars that teach you all those steps. But one of the crucial steps is that we have to communicate with the, that patient's doctors. Uh, we don't want to just treat their apnea and not let the doctors know that, hey, that their apnea is being treated with a dental device. So it's kind of our obligation to send out these letters anyway. So we try to get every doctor that they see. Uh, and if you're screening the patient in your own office, you find a way to get them tested. And now they're or maybe they're already tested and aren't wearing their CPAP. And we're starting to treat them. Let's send letters to all their doctors at the beginning of treatment, middle of treatment, towards the end of treatment. And uh, those are what we have to do anyway. Uh, but at the same time, that's marketing. That's getting our name in front of them. I don't know if you get letters from your periodontist or orthodontist. You know, every time you see those, you're remembering 
uh, those those referral sources at that time. And then uh, once you you know get through a patient or two and they're going well, uh, you might want to call that doctor up uh, uh, and say, uh, you know, I treated the patient. You've got all my correspondence. Uh, I just wanted to get a get a hold of you and talk to you about Mr. Jones and make sure I did everything. Uh, according to what you would want me to do for your patient, any questions? And a lot of times those conversations will lead to the doctor saying, wow, this is great. I didn't know you were around. And then you can parlay that into saying, I'd like to come over and you know show you a little bit more about what we could do if you're open to that. So uh, it, it's a great opportunity. Software like DS3 we have will make you, these letters so much easier with all the templates and, uh, and everything that we have in place. So uh, I can't overemphasize that because Richard, we had to do it a harder way because it was a little harder to treat patients in their office because we had to send people in for sleep st tests in the labs and we didn't have ambulatory testing. Now with uh, the ability to get your patients tested more readily, if you'll do this and then communicate with the uh, the offices, it'll open up a ton of doors if you're not shy about uh, about doing that. Well, and even if you are shy, hire somebody who isn't shy. Yes. You know, there at you least get in the door. Um, the better looking they are, uh, the more successful they are. The, the the more people like them, you know, I would just hire somebody based on personality. They only need to be able to answer about 10 questions. That's how intense my training was for my marketing person. Your answer other than that is, you know what? That would be a great question for the doctor and I'll bet he'll answer that when he comes in for the lunch and learn, you know? So, uh, but I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, you know, when you when you talk about that. Yeah, I see questions coming in. If you've got questions, go ahead and, and, and type them in, and uh, uh, we'll we'll get to them as we go. If you if we, if we get more complicated and you have questions that we can't answer here or, or want more information, just type in consult or consultation, and we'll have one of our dental sleep medicine trainers get get in touch with you and sit down and spend some time to answer the questions more deeply. Uh, they're the ones that are answering the questions. A lot of them as we're going along, and we have a whole team of people at DS3 that that's all they do. So we're happy to. Happy to help you with this as much as possible. Um, again, we're identifying these these people. We're we're, we're I think that the, the, the consistent quality communication uh, that's not that's true. Uh, it's probably the backbone of developing these relationships because it helps you to get the relationship started. Uh, but then also, if if you get the doctors referring to you and you don't have that consistent quality communication, they're going to quit referring to you. So you've got to have a way to completely um, automate that as much as possible and get the, the doctors the, the correspondence that they, that they need. And that way you'll do the right thing and then your name uh, will be in front of them all the time. I mean, how many letters, have you looked at your uh, software and seen how many letters you've sent out this year, Rich, you think? I have. Oh, what's the number you, lately? You don't know. Uh, about 5,750 yeah. this year so far. So. Uh, that's all I do all day, every day, you know, is treat sleep patients. And I could not do this without DS3. So, yeah, Guy and I own most of DS3, and uh, that's self-serving when we say that. But we built this, and we, we do this because it's what we do. And, and you know, the, the, the way that you put stuff in, and then it automatically populates the letter, and you always got to change a couple little things and do that. But you're you're so right, Guy. Communication is just the key. I mean... I think most dentists write a couple letters a year. What we don't understand as dentists is that that's how physicians communicate. Right. When a physician refers somebody, when a primary care physician refers somebody to the ENT down the road because he's got a sinus infection and it's a little bit out of their league with handling it, that ENT 100% of the time will write a note back saying, thank you for the referral. This is what I found, and this is how I'm going to treat them. 100% of the time. Right. That's our job now. Now, that, that, has, that comes on us. So when you look at my practice and how busy and successful we are, and people say, well, golly, Rich, how did you do it? We, I did it exactly how we're telling you how to do it. We just that's what we do. And you just cannot overemphasize the communication part of that. Absolutely. And um, one thing, Rich and I, when we were designing DS3, we, we, we used to send a lot of snail mail letters, you know, stamp letters. And when we talked to the physicians, what we realized is that's not how they communicate. They communicate via fax. Uh, it's quicker, easier to get the information right then and there. And so uh, when we talk about these letters, most of them, because DS3 makes that simple, they're faxed. 
so we type it out, click a button, and I know that that doctor's got it in his hand uh, immediately and uh, saves us the, the, the cost of the, the stamp as well and, and files a copy of the letter for us. Um, can, I add, can I add one more thing there sure. on the letter guy? So yeah. we, again, I do a lot of these lunch and learns, and I had a group of nine physicians, two PAs and two nurse practitioners at a, at a big conference table the other day. And I said, you know, well, I'll communicate with you. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at writing letters. And can I ask anybody here, do you know what the single best thing you will like about my letters is? And everybody kind of goes, oh, you I know. know. And I said, there are three sentences or less. Yeah. That, that's it. Short. I'll, I'll they're short and sweet, and it won't take you more than six or seven seconds to say, hey, I read it. Hey, put this in uh, guy's chart, you know. But, but again, I'm constantly staying in, you know, their mind when you go back to these referral sources and they say, hey, why do you refer to Drake? Well, I, I, I know where my patient is. I know if they show up or not. I know if he's treating them or not. I know if they've fallen off the wagon. You know, it, it's just good. So. The other thing I I really like here that you have, Guy, is is we're kind of getting more into now when we're actually meeting with the physician, you know, what do we do? If if you walk into a physician's office and say, hey, I'm Dr. Drake, I, I'm a, a board-certified uh, dentist in dental sleep medicine, and, and I know most of your tra patients won't use CPAP, so I think you should send them to me. That, that's yeah. not the way we do this, you know. We go in there and we say, hey, I'm Dr. Drake. Um, uh, all I do is dental sleep medicine, and, and I'm getting patients from, from all over the place now, and a lot of my patients don't have a primary care physician or a lot of my patients don't have a sleep doctor. How, how can we work together with these people? So immediately you get their attention when they know that you understand that this needs to be somewhat reciprocal. You know, that, that really goes a long ways. And it goes back to that slide we had at the beginning, keeping the patient's best interest. If we're just here to help our patients, hey, I'm just here to help my patients. I want to help your patients. I want you to help my patients. And I think the take home on this slide I don't want to lose track of is I think when I leave the meeting with the physicians, I want to at least accomplish two things. What are the treatment protocols that they would prefer? Because a lot of them are different. They, they have different ways of doing titration tests, of handing off the patients, uh, and so forth. So how do we treat them, you know, from sleep testing to, 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 to what kind of communication you want, um, to follow-up um, to follow up visits in their office, and then how's the referral going to go? I mean, how am I going to know that patient needs me, uh, or that you, or how am I going to send them to you, even more importantly? I think we need to leave, we'll talk in more details about those, but uh, that's what I want to leave with, because uh, if we just leave and we all got along and thought they were great and we thought they were great and then we don't have any action items or any actionable uh, take home uh, what, what we're going to do with the first patient who walks in the door, uh, then we might get lost. And I think uh, it's important to, to write that down. We even have a spreadsheet for each the office at certain points as to, as to what they want, how they want that process to, 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 to work. So uh, on this slide, Rich, I think you already mentioned that, you know, we can ask if we can refer to them. But I think establishing the details of the meeting on this is important. Uh, you know, sometimes I've even gotten the uh, misinformation on that, and we show up and they were expecting lunch or weren't expecting lunch, and we brought it. Uh, I thought, you know, we're going to have 30 minutes, we have five minutes. Uh, I think I'm speak speaking to five people and I'm speaking to 50 people. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen much anymore, but early on that, that happened, and I like to know about that because if it's a small group, uh, you know, I don't bring a PowerPoint, and I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint and talk to two people. That's, you know, it's impersonal. But when they're 75 and it's a big group, it's probably the most efficient way to, to talk to that group. So understanding what they're wanting to know, uh, if they want to know something specific, uh, that's key. And then be on time. I know a lot of dentists aren't on time. I'm, I can tell you I'm perpetually five minutes late to most things, but when it comes to the doctor's offices, I just lie to myself. And I, uh, I tell myself the appointment's different than it is. I get there early. They seldom see you early, but I don't want to be late and rushing around for it. And then here's the big one, doctors. I know you're busy. And if you think the meeting's going to be over at 1, then pretend it's going to be over at 1.30 because they're going to run late. Uh, and then the last thing you want to do is be all the way over there, and then you have to leave about the time they, they decide that they'll give you the time of day and come in the room. So 
mm -hmm. add more time on the end of it because it's always going to take a little bit longer because you're kind of uh, seeing them at their convenience because uh, last thing you want to do is either keep your patients waiting or be stressed because you're trying to rush you out of there. So uh, this Rich, when, I, when Rich saw the slide, he's like, are you going to bring all this stuff? No. <laughs> this is no, this is kind of your bag of of goodies that you may consider bringing, and there's more of this than 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 on this list. But there's different things, and you know, each time I go into the offices, I try to think of something new, and you know, to interest them. And so maybe this will be considered, you know, just a short list of some ideas of what you might want to bring with you when you come. I think the only one that I would mention for sure, and then Rich, we can talk about these other ones, is the practice parameters. Um, if it's a new referral source and uh, you think that they may not understand where dental uh, devices fit into the treatment of uh, sleep apnea, then bring in a copy of the 2015 practice parameters by the AASM, AADSM. I like to bring the abbreviated version, of two, the two-page uh, kind of take-home six-point uh, message and print that out maybe on my letterhead. And then uh, if you can get branded um, USB drives, are really nice with your name and logo or something on it. And then you can put the 50 uh, something pages of the full study on it or any of these other longer studies that, that you like. What do, what do you typically bring Rich out of this? I, I can tell you what I think is by far the most important thing on that list and that's the food. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but I think what happens guy is we went over the staff so well. Right. We went over the staff, and there's a couple of questions on there about, you know, a, uh, how do we get to the MD and this and that. So my deal is when, when my marketing person sets this meeting up, she does exactly what you said. How many people are there? Do they come in shifts? Do they all come at once? Do they, you know, you just want to know. Until you do a few of these, you won't kind of know what we're talking about. So we're trying to give you a heads up. You know, how, how do we handle this type of thing? And she says, you know, as a courtesy to Dr. Drake for providing lunch, we would really appreciate five minutes of the doctor's time. Can you tell me which of the doctors you've scheduled time out for Dr. Drake for? So today there were seven MDs in there. Well, only two of them showed up. They told us three would. But two out of three is still not bad. So, you know, part of that is, you know, as a courtesy, part, a lot of things with what we do, Guy, is how we say it. I think that's one of the things you taught me is you're very good at how you phrase those things and you do that. And, you know, so that that's one way that we kind of get past the gatekeeper and we do that. And, you know, have all of these things in your pocket, like Guy said. And when you go in there and the guy goes, well, are there any studies about this? Yeah, actually there are. Here's a few that, you you know, we can talk about real quickly. And just, just be prepared, I think, more than anything. Yeah, and think about your audience. Uh, we, we had an audience with the Manatee County um, uh uh, the Manicant County Government uh, Insurance Division, and they do C CPAP, and uh, I happen to know the lady a little bit, and she's got enough knowledge about uh, CPAP compliance. She's even mentioned it uh, when we had a preliminary discussion. So I had studies on CPAP compliance because I, I knew that interest her to some degree. So try to know your audience, and I would say always bring a device model. Uh, I mean, it, it, they, they they like something they can hold on. I'd say that's right up there with the food. Because if they've never seen one of these, uh, you want to show them, you know what the, uh, you know what they look like, and uh, just, you know, I wouldn't bring ten of them, just bring one. Uh, it doesn't matter which kind it is necessarily, and let them know there's there's other ones out there. Uh, we'll talk about a few of these things that that we bring, but I think the most important thing is to bring her confidence. Um, just, I, I I know we're 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 hammering this to some degree, but you know if you feel like the little kitten here, just walk in there like you're the lion. Uh, Understand that your confidence is they'll they'll, they'll understand uh, that uh, you you aren't confident if you aren't. So you you've got to go in there and just uh, not just because they have MD behind their name doesn't mean that they're any different than you all. They will put their pants on one leg at a time like everybody else. So <laughs> you know don't don't let them intimidate you. Most of, most of the experiences are very good, uh, and uh, you get out of your they, own way with that. They absolutely are, aren't they, guy? They absolutely are good. I think you will be pleasantly surprised. And you got to remember it's a numbers game too. You know, if you're just getting started in dental sleep medicine and the first two patients you had hated their dental device and couldn't wear it and couldn't get used to it, well, you got off to a bad start. That's not good. That tells me the next seven or eight are going to love it. 
you know? So remember, it's the same way with physicians. We do this all day, all the time. And our, our goal is one in 10 physicians that we talk to turns into a referral source where they refer one or, or more patients a week, right? a week. Yep. So when we find a really good physician that gets it, and we treat their patient well and we do all of that. It really has this snowball effect because now that you don't have to win them over, they're already doing it. They're actually talking to their buddies at the medical society meetings and on the golf course. Hey, do you know that Yatros guy? Man, he really does a good job with my patients that can't wear CPAP, you know? Um, you only need one really good one out of those, too, because I mean, it's yeah. not. Uh, the majority of our patients come from, uh, you know, a, a, a handful or two of, of referral sources. It's not like if you want 100 patients a month, you need 100 referral sources. You need 10 good ones if that's what you want. So, and you gotta, you are gonna get rejected. I mean, we're saying that the physicians are nice and it goes well, and it usually does, but it doesn't always go well. I've gone into rooms where they've, you know, kind of been less than courteous. Um, uh, we've shown up and they decided they didn't have time for us. Uh, I mean, uh, don't be uh, uh, be afraid of rejection. I should put a picture of my wife here and say, hey, you stick with it long enough, <laughs> you could outkick your coverage, you know? So uh, <laughs> say it loud enough to hear me downstairs. <laughs> but don't be afraid. It's, uh, it's it, it, Life's too short to walk, run around being worried about someone uh, rejecting you. They, they, there'll be plenty of people that'll be happy to, to uh, accept you into their offices. And I see more questions coming in. We're going to get to, the, to those as uh, we go along as well. So... I, I love up. this guy. I love this slide guy. You guys out there need to take a picture of this with your phones, you know, because this is a very good summary of this. You know, it, it kind of you're you're talking about, hey, inquire about how how they do this with their practice. What do you like to do? You know, if it's a primary care physician, he may say, oh, man, I really like doing heart stuff. You know, I I should have been a cardiologist. OK, well, don't go down that road too far. But, you know, I, I like doing this. And then you just start asking questions. You know, how do you sleep test people? Oh, I love to refer to this sleep doc down the road. Oh, yeah, we work with, uh, you know, Dr. G all the time. Absolutely. You know, you're just asking questions. You know, what do you recommend? You know, people can't wear CPAP. What do you do? You, you'd, you just have this genuine concern for your patients. And if you do that in a question asking format like this slide shows you here, the, the physician never gets defensive and throws up his hands. And now it becomes just a kind of a nice cordial conversation about, you know, how we can help our patients. Yeah, I don't think I have it on here, but you, you might say, what do you what do you know about dental sleep? What do you yeah, know about these you devices? Like uh, you know, uh, just I think asking more questions uh, it, it, when you're nervous, if you go into there, the first thing you want to do is just spew out everything, you know, and, uh, <laughs> That's exactly and just, what people want to do. Isn't it? It's, uh, and, and you got to just take a breath and just relax and try to ask more questions. Just make up your mind. You're going to ask more questions than you're going to tell. Uh, and, and that will get you just a long, long way with this. So. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, you know, if they ask questions and it leads to this, I'm going to show them the study models. Uh, I'm going to show them the Hokeman study, which I think I have coming up here in a minute, uh, the Wisconsin sleep studies, these other ones that we, we may go into, the practice parameters. And and I think I will emphasize when we do get a chance to talk and tell, um, uh, you know, make sure you have a defined dental sleep therapy uh, treatment protocol, uh, even printed out. It's nice to hand them if you have that, but at least you know what it is and you can articulate it to the doctors. I mean, it's just uh, their perception oftentimes is you give them this piece of acrylic and, uh, and and that's it. You need to walk them through how you have a consultation, how you, you know, you, you look at their symptoms and we make sure they're the right fit and that takes a period of time and that we evaluate their oral condition and we make sure that they're stable and that we decide which device will work for them and how we take the bite and, and maybe even take imaging CBCTs or, or x-rays or panorexes, and then how we custom make the devices at the lab uh, after we take impressions or digital impressions, and how we walk them through the titration of symptoms and then uh, 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 follow up sleep tests, and then we're gonna see them in six months. Now, when you go through all that, and then what you say is, you know, so that's kind of what we do. What questions do you have about that? What would you like differently done for your patients? They're gonna be, be wild if, uh, to understand that you're doing more than just handing them. Uh, the, the, the piece of acrylic. I, I do want to emphasize on that treatment protocols that uh, we do want to define, I think the one thing in particular is how they would like 
me to do the follow-up sleep testing. Sometimes the offices want to do the testing themselves. They want you to send them back. Sometimes they would prefer you use your own sleep testing equipment to titrate them. Sometimes uh, I even have one doctor, Rich, I don't know if you have any of these, but he wants everybody to have a follow-up follow PSG still. And so I let the patient know at the consultation, hey, you're going to go back to, to Dr. X and he's going to do the follow-up PSG in the lab. I just don't even give them a choice and they just think that's, you know, what everybody does. They don't know so, any different. Yeah, yeah so cause I want to I want to do what he wants me, uh, he or she wants me to do. So uh, I take this book a lot, Rich. Do you take, I mean, I buy these by the dozen uh, and uh, for my initial meetings oftentimes. Do, do, you, do you utilize these, that, that book at all? You know, I hadn't thought about that guy. Maybe we could put the plate of food on the, <laughs> we buy a flimsy plate and we put it on the book. So it, you know, but yeah. it's a great study. You guys have to get this if you don't have it and read through it. You can breathe through the whole thing in about an hour, hour and a half. You know, right. it's Arnaud Hokema who did his uh, thesis on this back in 07. It's the best study ever done that looks at uh, oral appliances and CPAP. So he age matched all of these people and then we're going to treat them. You know, back then in 07, um, we were just trying to get the AHI below 30 for the most part. You know, he had it below 20, reduced by 50 percent. And you look at the numbers there with the oil appliance and the CPAPs, there's not a whole lot of a difference, you know, when you get it below 20. But if you got to get it below 10 or 5, you know, that's where CPAP starts to shine a little bit. But again, you don't have the compliance issues. Yeah, and I'll I'll take a little note and try to write something on the front cover and then take a little sticker. This is Chapter 4, I believe. Put a little sticky uh, flag on Chapter 4. And then if you go to the appendix, it rescores that for, for AHI 5 which doesn't really even affect the uh, non-severe. We stick those still stay at 84% and then uh, and put that better. By all means, read this book first <laughs> before, you, yeah. before you give it to, to them. But uh, it's a it's a nice thing to bring. Oh, there's, I, I wasn't sure I had that slide in. So there's the AHI for five when they rescored it, uh, you know, uh, for that. So I put a little sticker on each of those and just uh, let, let them know uh, uh, what that's all about. Uh, this, this study, uh, Rich, I use with my patients a lot. Uh, I'll back it up. I went a little too fast. Uh, it's a study that has been going on for about 20 years. And I, again, I let me back up for a second. I mean, you might bring some of this stuff with you and have it in, you know, in a briefcase or something. Don't just come and just throw all this on the desk. I mean, you'll right. have that conversation, find out where they're going, and and, that the, and if uh, uh, it's appropriate, then maybe this study is the one you want to pull out to, 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 to show them the the, the AHI and and what happens? These people aren't severe uh, or, or severe aren't being treated. And when we look at the, these patients, we know that a thousand of them or more have been tested on a, every seven years for 20 years. And the people who had severe apnea, you know, 57 or so percent of them are still around. About 40, you know, 40 some percent of them are dead. And what we what I use for here is I, I just like to give them a demonstration and say that, you know, for people up here, we can usually get them as good as CPAP, but I want you to understand if I've got a patient who can't wear CPAP, uh, don't send them down to the ENT unless it's really indicated. Let me have a shot at them. We can take them and we take a little red pen and I can move them here to here and and and, and draw that on the card. I do that for my patients. We can move them up to moderate apnea uh, most of the time. And uh, how would that be, doctor? Would that Because I think they hadn't thought of it that way before. And if we don't have that discussion, uh, we get someone that's AHI 35 and we get them down to seven, and then the doctor thinks, well, it's a failure. You know, we uh, put them back on CPAP, even though maybe they, you know, took the CPAP and ran it over with their truck because they hated it so bad. They didn't read the chart note about that one. But uh, you know, I've had all those things happen. So, I mean, I think that's a good study to to have in your in your bag of tricks, uh, if if so. And I'd be real cautious about this one. Have you? I have presented this a few times, but I, I think where appropriate it is. Uh, have you? Given this to, to, to the doctors, Rich, the yeah, study. just the, the only time we even talk about that's with the cardiologist. Right. Um, I just ask them if they're familiar with that study, and surprisingly, a couple of them have not been, but uh, even a couple of years after it's been out. But you know, really, we're not we're, we're, we're seeing that when we intervene with CPAP, you know, years later, we're still not seeing any difference in cardiovascular event outcome, significant cardiovascular events. So people go, oh, you know, what? what's the deal with that? Because I think it's a little bit eye-catching because we've been preaching forever that CPAP treats all of this stuff. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is that these were non-symptomatic uh, uh, severe patients 
who were given CPAP to make them more healthy, and they found out they had just as many heart attacks and so forth afterwards. And we believe, as the people who didn't wear, weren't given the CPAP, and we believe that it has to do with the 3.3 hours of compliance per night that the, that the CPAPs were uh, when they looked at the chips on them for. So, uh, again, you got to know your audience. Uh, uh, this is the practice parameters that we already showed you, but I, I like printing this one out sometimes, and we you know, at least talk to the doctors about the mean disease alleviation calculation just because that kind of sounds cool when you say it, if nothing more. But uh, we can let them know that when we're looking at health our patients, that dental devices uh, overall can treat uh, uh, apnea as well in many cases, especially when uh, we're looking at 83 or so percent uh, uh, non-compliant. Uh, these are the six take-home uh, messages, too. I think, um, you know, when you go in order of preference, I think Rich is probably right, food's number one. <laughs> you know, dental devices are probably number two. But having these practice parameters are certainly important when you're going to a new physician because they usually don't know it. They don't even know they exist half the time, if that's been on what type of physician they are. Furthermore, that dental devices are indicated for snoring and for people who have apnea as an alternative to CPAP. So I print these six uh, uh, the points out on one page, uh, which you can you can read them yourself. I don't we're not here to go through the the practice parameters, but essentially what it says is that anybody'd rather have a, a dental device to, as compared to CPAP. That's what they should have, uh, even even for the severe cases, and that they should be made by a dentist and they should be custom made dental devices. And that's what what we do. And I think you know coming prepared like that um, will we'll overcome a lot of the objections that they have. Uh, this is the the dental sleep therapy, and you, know, you can't read it probably, it's a little small on your screen, but um, I think that's a good thing to take as well, put it on your logo, come out with your treatment protocols. Uh, do you hand these out, Rich, or just verbally go over it? We have them, you know, if it comes up, you know, usually we're handing these to the staff guy right. or to the, we, we really like to get the referral coordinator. You know, right. when we go to these big offices, I want to know who the referral coordinator is, and I'm going to bring her a special iced cookie, you know, <laughs> and uh, she's she's going to get this for sure because, again, it's, you know, how does this work? You know, how do we work with you? What do you want? How do you want to sleep test them? How do you want us to follow up? Do you want a letter every time I see them? No, no, no. Sometimes we go back. We do a lunch and learns guy every six to 12 months for doctors who refer us a lot of patients. Right. So we just go back and we go, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, you guys do such a great job. We want to do that, you know. And, and a lot of times, you know, they'll go, hey, man, quit sending me so many letters, you know, just one at the front and one at the back or something like that. But, again, that's part of what you do. But the referral coordinator can be a very valuable asset uh, in that entire process as well. Yeah, and I think uh, probably learned this from my periodontist over the years. You know, he always would tell me, you send me a patient, and they're going to thank you for sending them over. And, you know, I love sending patients to my two periodontists I worked with for many years, and they would come back, even if they decided not to go forward to periodontal treatment. Oh, I loved them. They were really nice. I'm, you know, they'd have some reason maybe not to do it. And so it makes you look good. And so I want to assure that doctor, look, you send me someone. At the very least, they're going to come back to you and say, you know, I was treated great. Thank you for the referral. Uh, you know, they, 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 was, they were, they were top-notch and professional. And they're going to get a letter from me whether the patient goes forward treatment or not. And the key to this is when we talk about the protocols that we establish, okay, if you're going to refer me a patient, I always ask the doctors, if possible, I would prefer that you take these referral pads and ask the patient, say, I'm going to refer you over to Dr. Yatros's office. Do you mind if I go ahead and give him your name and let him contact you? That way, I know you referred them. If you just tell them to call me, you may think I dropped the ball because the patient never calls. So if they, you know, actually fax me a referral, then I can assure them that they were always going to get a letter back from me one way or another and that we're not going to drop the ball. And they, they get that, and I think it does keep the, the patients from falling through the, the cracks. And what else it does, it, it kind of makes the patient have some action. If they say, well, call, you know, here's a list of people, but, well, if you have your referral pads there and they, you know, here's who you need to call, it's almost like the doctor has ordered that to some degree, and it's, it's, it's just a, a lot more likely that you're going to get in touch with that patient than if they just uh, give them your phone number. Yep. All right. Well, the next, you still there, Rich? <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking through the questions. Okay. Making sure uh, we're answering all of them and we're, well, we're getting, doing a good job. Well, you got such a great team, you know, so 
Uh, you know, if you want more information, again, you can type in consult and one of our team will, will get with you. We can tell you more about how we can help your practice and we'll, we'll spend some time just answering more in detail some of the questions you have, not only about MD referrals, but anything to do with dental sleep. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've already got this, uh, slide pretty much down. I'm going to go to, to the next one. I think I hammered that. I, I think, uh, this is something that is really important. Um, uh, I know a lot of people are trying to get certifications of this, that, or the other, you know, because I want the doctors to refer to me and I don't know if they're going to refer if I don't have, you know, this checked off or that checked off, but I don't know. They don't typically ask me, Hey, are you a diplomat or, you know, they, they, they may ask how many of these patients you treat or they, they may, but they always ask this question a hundred percent of the time. I mean, that, that, that's the, the question before you leave, if they're interested in referring you someone, they're going to ask you, how much does it cost? Do you accept medical insurance? And yeah, they may ask you if you've done it before, but uh, I would say that's, you know, uh, uh, 100% of the time, especially with new new referrals. And how you answer this is extremely important. I think that it's going to make or break your whole time there at that office. Uh, if you spewed out a, a fee, even if you think it's a low fee, uh, I think that that's probably going to go wrong for you. Um, I think that they just don't know what goes into it. And even if you tell them it's $800, uh, they're going to, that, that they may look at that uh, uh, look at that wrong. So uh, I would just say, I mean, you got some some things you can you can look here, answer the questions. But uh, what I always say to the patient to them is, look, you know, it depends. Yes, we take insurance. Yes, we take Medicare, um, and we will work for your patients to make sure that they get the appropriate treatment. And what they pay depends on their insurance and their ability to pay. And we're going to do everything we can to get them treated uh, if if that's the pro proper thing for them. And you're going to get correspondence either way. I think you, you you've turned it around on the doctors in the past. I think you told me once, Rich. Yeah, but I think the most important thing there too, Guy, is that you do work with the patient. You do work with their medical insurance. Oh, that's true. You do work to minimize the patient's out-of-pocket expense. Look, I want to help that patient. I don't want to set my fee up here. My quick story, do I have time for a quick, My when I walk into a cardiologist's office, and we're going to do a sure. lunch and learn. And I, a lot of times I'll stand there at the door with the plates, literally, and I'll go, okay, what's my name? I don't know. What's your name? It's Richard Drake. You got to say Richard Drake. Okay, Richard Drake. Okay, you can have your plate for food now. You know, <laughs> I, I do that. You know, half the time I do that. And this guy walks up and he starts piling this food on. He, you know, everybody's in scrubs at this office. This guy looks like the janitor, you know. And he goes, he turns around, looks at me, he goes, how much you charge for these things? And I go, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get to meet you. I'm Dr. Drake. Oh, yeah, I'm Dr. Guillermo. I'm the cardiologist. Okay. And I go, well, I got a question for you. How much do you charge for a heart cath? <laughs> he goes, well, it depends. Okay, that's a good answer. That's my answer, too. It depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he I goes, love it. He just that's shook true. my hand. It's true. He shook my true. hand. He shook my hand and he said, we're going to get along just fine. And yeah, he walked out the room. Yeah. The guy referred me 52 patients in the next year. Well, what are we doing? That's yeah. the entire extent of, of our initial, you know, interaction. <laughs> so. Because you went in there confident and, uh, I mean, that's, a, and that's a true answer. So, um, I think once we finally get through the door, so we'll wrap this up on time here. And we, you know, we've, we've, we've done all these things, right. We've got someone that calls our office from Dr. Smith. You know, we went through all this trouble. And, you know, to me, my team knows that we, when someone calls from a new referral source, we've been trying to get to send us a patients. It's like all hands on deck. You know, we're going to do everything for this patient, uh, to get them in the door, make sure we don't run behind. It's, uh, you know, make sure that we see them appropriately. And, you know, and, and in this case, if they don't have the greatest insurance, I'm going to be a lot more lenient on what they pay me. I, if they're Medicare, I'll accept assignment of benefits so they don't have to pay anything. You know, make sure their experience is great. Get, make sure all the letters go out. And then once we're nearing the end of treatment and they've gotten the follow-up letters and, uh, and and maybe even after treatment, I'm going to call that physician up and say, hey, we, we appreciate your referral. I just want to walk through, make sure we gave you everything you wanted. We saw Dr. Uh, Mr. Smith or whatever his name is, and, you know, can we do anything better? Let's just, and usually they go, oh, no, it was great. Uh, but they, they, you know, it just solidifies 
that you, and if they want something done differently, that's their opportunity to tell you. So I'm, it's not just for marketing and to try to get, get in front of them again. It really is to make sure that you're doing what is, is needed within the realm of what you feel comfortable with, obviously, uh, to make the patients happy and to make the referral facility, uh, source happy. And, you know, if you do that, uh, it's going to, you know, be smooth sailing. Um, I think after that, and Rich, you've already talked about this, that you do this every six months. You can't ignore these people. You can't ignore relationships in life. Let's leave it at that, right? You've got to continue to work on them, whether it's your family, friends, uh, kids, uh, and your coworkers. I mean, you can't just take anything for granted uh, and continue to treat them. Uh, I think treating uh, their patients and meeting with them on a regular basis. Uh, we give a discount oftentimes for the team members that come over. I see that on this list. I think that's that's great. And you got to have a way to track this. So um, I can tell you we're not perfect. I went through some changes in my, my team, and uh, we, we kind of dropped off. We quit doing the lunch and learns. We quit. We weren't tracking it. Makes, it. We, makes a difference, doesn't it? It made a difference in my wallet, I can tell you that. I mean, it uh, – <laughs> You know, yeah. you know, had more free time, but uh, besides that, you know, it's uh, it, it, if, if I mean, and I, these referral sources have been referring to me for 15 years, right. and uh, because I had some changes in uh, my associate and, uh, and and you know got busy at other things in life, and uh, we did we kind of you know we're back on track now, but uh, it, it, it absolutely you can't let it go. You got to stick with them, and I think at least once a year, if you're real ambitious, every three months, probably somewhere in between is the right time to. To keep going to see these these people who are already referring you and and I think what you have to understand here this goes up and down I mean sometimes they'll refer you a bunch of patients and they kind of forget about you sometimes you go over there and they're you know had a great day and they're thrilled to see you next time they don't give you the time of day uh, and just understand they're humans they've got lives their practices go up and down they have their own challenges and just keeping in touch with them on a regular basis and uh, understand that everything ebbs and flows uh, you'll 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 do just fine. Uh, and but I think, I we'll think end, yeah. I think more than anything, guy, that helps the psyche of of us as dentists. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times, if you're not, if you are new at this and you don't have that confidence, you're going, "Oh man, is is it me? Is it the way I treated that last patient? Is it this? Is it that?" You know, some of us are worry warts anyway. But just understand that there's kind of an ebb and flow to all of that kind of stuff, and just just be the best that you can be. You know, right. communicate with them. How can we do this better? How would you like to do this? That all of these things that we've talked about, every single one of these things that we've talked about tonight is important at some point or another. Right. They're not all important all the time, but at some point or another, everything that we've talked about tonight is important. It is. And I think the backbone, as we mentioned, is this communication. And, uh, you know, when, uh, back to my office, I looked and some of the letters weren't being written as well as they mm -hmm. should have been. Uh, I just I was like, oh, my gosh. And I tell you the truth. You know how I noticed it, Rich? I, my bank account went down and I went and looked and I ran the report about how many letters we'd written. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're not writing enough letters. I just knew from the volume of letters it was barely over a thousand letters. Uh, earlier on in the you know first part of the year, and I'm like, I know that we're not doing our job just from that alone because we can mm -hmm. run a report in DS3 on that. So, uh, it, 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 you know, got back on track, got a you know new partner in who's doing great, and we're 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 screaming with it right now. And it's not hard to do if you have systems in in place, but it's easy to get kind of just uh, complacent with it. And you've got to you've got to just stay with it. I mean, you got to persevere and understand that uh, if the first door shuts on you, the next one's going to open. Um, it, it, we wouldn't just be telling you that. We're not special people. Um, well, it might be special in a weird way, but, uh, you know, we're not, we're not special as far as we don't have any special talents that make us get through the doors of these doctors uh, other than I think we've maybe thick-skinned a little bit and we're not worried about rejection. And, uh, you, you know, you just – if you're – you don't have to have some – you know, big light shine and say, now's the day I'm going to go do this. Just go do it. Yeah. Uh, you're going to, you're going to get, th get through it and, and persevere. And uh, here's Rich and me. <laughs> I don't know which one I am, but I guess it's maybe it's <laughs> Rich and Nathan. Well, a little more hair. <laughs> it's Rich and Nathan, maybe his son. But, uh, you know, I, I think the thing is, is a lot of times, oh, they're not, they're not biting. I'm going to these offices and I, you know, they're not referring me any patients. And, you know what? All it takes is one. It's not you know one good fishing hole. I consider you find a doctor, and then that's just going to keep bringing back. So you may 
you may cast your line a bunch of times, and then you'll find a honey a hole or spot where where they're going to keep coming in, and you and they refer you that patient. You treat them well. You do correspondence appropriately. They'll keep sending your patients over and over again. So it, it it's it's like turning on a water faucet. Uh, it, it they'll they'll come back to you. So. Well, it does it really does bring build momentum too? You know, it really does because if you just get into one, and then that one you treat a couple of patients well, that that doctor may be your key into getting with the doctor that won't return your calls or won't do any of that stuff. So, right. you got to see where you are, and you got to see where you want to go, and you need a plan. You know right. that it's not just going to happen. You have to use your brain. That's what I always like to say. You got to use your brain and think about this and see how you get from point A to point B. And we've, we've given you a lot of tools tonight. We really have. We've given you some very good information and it hasn't cost you anything other than your time. And if you put this to use, um, you're, you're gonna see a big uptick in what you do and how you do it. Right, and if you want more help, I mean, we, uh, we're really proud about what we do. We, we had a meeting today on, uh, kind of our uh, culture in our office, and which is very good, and talking about what we do and why we do it. And, you know, the consensus is still, Rich, what you and I started the business for. We are here because we feel that there's a, a need. There's a need for dentists to get involved and to help treat sleep apnea of dental devices because one out of ten people have apnea know they have it, so nine out of ten don't know, and those do, that do aren't successfully treated. That's why we started Dental Sleep Solutions, and that's why we have a whole team of about two dozen people that just help dentists do this in their offices. If you want help with that, uh, it's not a pushy sales thing. I promise you we're not that kind of a company. Just type in consult and someone of our, our uh, member support team will, will meet with you. We'll look at where you are in your dental sleep practice, uh, look at what your challenges are, and we can talk about how we can get you to where you you want to be and you'll get some great free advice. Uh, we can tell you how we can help you further down the road, of course, if you want. But uh, if you type that in, that's, uh, I mean, well worth your time. We have a solution to help you from everything from screening, testing, treating, and billing. That's what we do. Um, part of the reason my dental sleep practice went down is because I uh, was so busy building uh, this great company that helps dentists do dental sleep in their practices. And I, I can be say that I'm very proud about what we do, and there's no one in the country going to help you more. So if you're interested in learning more, or wanting more, just type in that consult and someone will uh, talk to you, Jody or, or Brandy, most likely. And again, here's your uh, last chance for the courses. If you just type in course, no obligation, but it'll secure. Uh, the first time we offered us 200, I think Rich about fell out of his chair because at 995 for a sleep test, a dental device, and two days of CE uh, and lunch. Oh, we take people to dinner Friday night, too. I didn't even mention that. So uh, uh, Rich will follow his chair again when I say that uh, for $795. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> so uh, you, you can't beat it. And I promise you, you will you will get uh, a great hands-on advice. No one does uh, better than we do as far as teaching you how to do this uh, in your practices. So there's the dates. And if uh, you're not sure about the date, just go ahead and type in course, and uh, you know we'll we'll hold that fee for you for whatever period of time is uh, that that they agree to. Uh, again, don't forget uh, Mark Fowler and our COO Jason Tyranny. Uh, who's been with us for a long time, but uh, those of you who don't know, he had uh, a lot of background in dental lab business, and uh, he honestly knows uh, more about marketing than about anybody I know other than maybe Mark. Uh, he's, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you see come from us uh, or magazine or symposium. Uh, we certainly have Kelly that helps us with that as well, but Jason's behind a lot of that. So uh, I'm positive that this will be worth your time. So if you can get the medical referrals on one aspect, you could do the other marketing uh, between this and the next webinar. You should have as many patients as you want uh, in your practice for dental sleep medicine uh, treatment. So the last thing I think, this might be the last slide, is, is for free. Uh, we have our uh, Dental Sleep Medicine Insider magazine. I know that they're bugging me to get my next uh, article or video in here shortly. We'll have one coming out next month. We had one come out uh, last month. It's every other month. Free comes into your inbox. Just go there, sign up. I think we're on over two dozen now, I think pushing 30 of these. And if you uh, want to know uh, about any dental sleep, go ahead and just uh, uh, sign up and you can go back and look at the, the back courses. So uh, look at that, Rich, uh, four after, not not too bad to keep us on time here. And on, uh, That's because you let me talk a little bit more tonight, Guy, which I appreciate. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, so, that's always a struggle when the, the two of us are on. I, I, that's I end up right. We got to fight for for the <laughs> airtime for sure. So hopefully you guys learned something. Um, guy, I'm looking through the questions here. There was one about yeah. food. Uh, you guys can go now. You're going to get your CE. You will, we'll answer the kind of the straggling questions here and talk about some of this stuff. Um, you know, Don, I I struggled with this in the beginning, you know, with the food thing. You know, we well, what do you guys like? You know, oh, we like uh, Mexican food. Um, everybody likes fajitas, but the doctor is a vegan, so he wants a, a salad with a gua side of guacamole and um, – raspberry vinaigrette dressing you know and and it, we just it just got to be such a mess so our deal now is we spend a hundred dollars on food that's it that's the most i spend uh you can buy a lot of food for a hundred dollars um we have always some type of sandwich or wrap or something like that we have some type of vegetable tray usually we buy a couple bags of chips uh we buy some iced tea maybe a lemonade um, and some cookies, you know, or something like that. And, you know, that that's something for everybody. You know, if people go, well, there's like 10 of us in the office and eight of us are vegans. Well, we'll get a big thing of salad then, you know, and we'll get a couple of different kinds of dressing. So, but again, you know, be, be reasonable. I'm not going to take your orders. I'm not going to personally order this stuff. You know, when people say, what are you going to bring? We'll say that well, this is what we do, you know, um, that's not good enough. Okay. You know, we don't have to come if you don't want to. So, be you know, that what we do so many of these, that just really helps us be efficient at what we do. And I will say very, very rarely do we ever have a, not have people say thank you. You know, thank you for lunch. We appreciate you bringing that. And um, it, it usually goes really well. And especially people that don't want to eat meat or sandwiches, they go, thank you so much for bringing the vegetable tray and the salad and that kind of stuff. Right. And make sure you bring napkins, forks. Uh, sometimes we forget right. that. Uh, plates. Plates, cups. Uh, plates, cups, because if you order it from the restaurant and it's just kind of all in paper, it's nice to have some paper plates and stuff so they don't have to be scrounging around through their kitchen for, for knives and everything like that. And, and the, on that subject, because, I mean, it seems like a pretty easy subject, but it's really, really not. I mean, it's a great question. It really it seriously is. Um, I do dinners. Uh, well, not, no, I don't do dinners. I do lunches. I used to do dinners. I mean, if the doctor will take the time to meet me for a meal, for like a yeah. sit-down meal, I will certainly do that. Just he or she and I one-on-one, -on -one. and I do that on a regular basis as well. Uh, I've learned to do lunch though, <laughs> because yeah. you know, don't say where do you want to go, because I made that mistake once a long time ago, and uh, the uh, referring doctor who ended up referred me a lot of patients. He said. Oh, you know, you live on Anna Maria Island. I want to go to the beach bistro. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, so we took him there, and it was a $125 bottle of wine he bought. I think he thought I was a pharmaceutical company back in the day when the pharmaceutical companies were spending all that. The bill was $500. Uh, so it was uh, – so don't make that mistake. Take him to lunch, and then you decide. Give him one or two choices. How about we go here or here or here, you know, yeah. and, and go for lunch. It won't cost you as much, and you'll get just as much out of it and you won't be away yes, from you will. Of your family and so forth. Were you going to add something that, else to that? No, that goes back to ask me how I know, you know, yeah. because we made a yeah. lot of these mistakes, you know? Yeah. So, so that right there save you $500. <laughs> if, uh, but the guy ended up being a great referral source. I actually ended up working out of his office for years, but uh, so it was probably a good investment. But uh, uh, other than that, that's, uh, that's our advice on that. I see a lot of people putting in the courses. Look forward to seeing you there. Um, I got the notes. Oh, over here on the other screen. Yeah, Anything else we missed on here, Rich? Well, early on, guy, you know, people are frustrated with the insurance and getting paid. And, you know, we're we're gonna do another one of those webinars in the not too distant future. So we'll we'll do that. And you know, again, I think I would just say, you know, persevere. You're you're absolutely right. When come this is what we do in my office now. So when we file a claim and they say, Oh, you didn't send this. Yes, we did. Okay, we send it again. Well, by the third time we do it, um, we basically threaten them with a complaint to the Texas Department of Insurance. We find out who's standing by the fax machine. We get a name. We get a number. We document it. We send it. You know, so we have all of that information there, and we document it. So we we have to get a little bit mean and nasty, you know, when we do some of that stuff. I mean, just that tip alone 
will help you with uh, that. You know, your your person who does insurance in your office uh, is is a very special person. You know, because you have you need to be nice to them because if you look at them wrong, they just might shoot you. You know, because <laughs> they're dealing with people that they have to they have to be like that. You know, and that's why we we tell everybody, look, don't do it. Outsource this. Let a third wow. party do it. And if they're not doing it well, then you get on the phone and this, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, uh, change, uh, hire another one, do something. Um, but again, it's persistence and, and, you know, you have to think about getting in network. Yeah. And let me, and, let, let me add something to that too. So okay. uh, we, if you're thinking about coming to the symposium, we're doing a full day uh, kind That's of right. in, in concert at, at the same time as a symposium. So you don't even have to, this kind of separate, but at the same time. So you can sign up for that and not the symposium and vice versa, but it's a full day limited space. There's not going to be hundreds of people in this room. It's going to, going to be a few dozen that uh, is, is what the room will hold uh, so that we can really have an intimate uh, uh, setting for uh, plenty of time to answer this question. So it's the first time we've done this and I'm confident that, that if you want to know more about billing, that's the place to come and, and, and when you should do it. So it'll be at the same time. It's on, uh, uh, what's the 15th, I guess, is the, fifth, the, the first day of the symposium, uh, whatever day that is, the 15th of February, I think it is. It's the yeah, 15th and 16th of this year it is. So, uh, and, and still same place. Uh, so look at doing that. And, uh, and like Rich said, uh, have someone else help you with this. Uh, I'm very proud of our subsidiary company, Four Pillar Billing. Lisa, our manager there, uh, we had a long meeting today. Uh, she's just uh, uh, you know been doing insurance billing for 25 years. Uh, worked for Humana, all these uh, other insurance companies. So you get somebody like that working on your side. Uh, we won't say it's without headache because insurance always has headaches, but uh, it will it will minimize your headaches. We'll 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 take on a lot of them. And if you try to do this on your own, uh, you got to be crazy. Um, you you, know, you got to be a little bit nuts to try to do it all by yourself. So let us help you with that. If you want to know more about that too. Uh, just uh, contact us here at DS3 or type in insurance consult or something like that, and we'll be happy to do that for you. So uh, anything else on there, Rich, we didn't get to because uh, you were reviewing? Uh, I think that's it. Looks, looks good. Very uh, engaged uh, group with the questions tonight, Guy. That was great. Fantastic. Thank you guys for engaging in this, and uh, we always appreciate your feedback, you know, about what we do and how we do it and how we can make it better what kind of other topics you want to see in here, you can contact our team and uh, let that be known. We, we certainly hope to see you uh, on our next webinar where uh, Jason and Mark will be talking about marketing. We certainly hope to see you at the uh, the symposium. Yeah, and uh, have, everybody have a happy holiday, happy new year. We, uh, uh, we'll we we'll be around if you need us, but uh, if not, we'll, we'll see you after the first of the year. And I guess I'll hit the end button here, Rich, if I can find it. Thanks again, Guy. Uh, Thank you all. Have a good night, buddy. All right, bye-bye.